Hey everybody, welcome back for another flea market finds. And this was a pick on October 21st of 2021. And this was uh, actually a Facebook marketplace uh, or Craigslist pick. I don't remember exactly which, but uh, this person had advertised that they had this lot of tools that they wanted to sell all as one lot. They didn't want to break it up and that their asking price was 150 firm. And they made that clear that it was gonna be firm. So uh, I uh, ended up checking out the pictures more closely and uh, ended up deciding that I felt it was worthwhile to go out and purchase this stuff for the 150. And that actually led to some other purchases. So I'm probably gonna have to split this up into a multi-parter. But let's knock out the uh, machinist items first. So uh, the reason why I decided to go out there and check this out was because some of the stuff that I had seen in the uh, photo were uh, you know, nice specialty mics. So let's just start with this though. This is a, uh, oops, this is a upside down box. This is a Helios made in Germany, uh, Vernier caliper. Uh, the Vernier calipers don't normally bring as much money because, you know, a lot of guys don't want to use Verniers anymore. Uh, this person worked in a machine shop inspection setting. And so they were following the, uh, the general advice of not storing your calipers or micrometers in the closed position. So you'll notice that there's an air gap left here. So but we can uh, loosen this up just to make sure it works perfectly and it is nice and smooth and you know it's a vernier so it's really hard to mess one of these up so this can be this can be one of the most um, dependable measuring devices in your shop and anyways this one is well it says it was the property of u.s gasket in connecticut not anymore um and it says add 0.460 to inside reading. So that is a reference to the fact that these jaws are made for outside or inside. So if you wanted to uh, make an inside measurement with these, these are your contact surfaces here. And you would just add 0.460 to whatever you get up here. It's got this nice satin finish on it. They're actually really nice. And again, they're made in Germany, so they're good quality. It's got a fine adjust. These are these are pretty darn nice. And here we have uh, one of the less spectacular items. It is a Minotoyo zero to one inch mechanical counting micrometer. It does have a slight issue, which is when it is closed. Oddly enough, the line on the lines almost line up perfectly, and it is a tenth micrometer, so I can actually look at the vernier here and see how far off this is. Well, let me clean the anvils first. That's <laughs> the starters. All right, let's try this again. Better, but it's still not quite perfect. Actually, I take that back. The vernier is lining up to zero. However, the counter is exactly one thou off. So right now, this counter should be reading zeros all across. In order for me to have it read zeros all across, I need to bring it back to about here. And that's about four tenths open. So there's gotta be a way to reclock this. Uh, I probably won't even bother. I'll just sell it as is. It's also missing the lock. But if somebody wanted to put a little bit of work into well, it's missing, it's actually missing the insulators too. This is a Mitotoyo, by the way. But the Mid it would have said that on the insulators here. So this is pretty, yeah, this will be a really cheap buy for somebody. Um, I'll probably end up keeping the case because I think I have one of these in much better condition that would go right in here. Yeah, I just checked the 193 211 is the correct part number for this micrometer, and I do have one. So uh, this is what this is what this is supposed to look like. And when you close mine up, you know it, it's pretty much dead on. Just that last digit might be a little bit low, but it's a little bit better. 
And we go 193 to 11. All right, so take care of that. There were a few items there that uh, they didn't have the original cases for, and this is one of them. And then this bit of a mystery here. Um, so this is a depth mic. It was just in this bag. It's a, actually a pretty nice Mitotoyo. It's in great shape. But the uh, interesting thing about it is there's some extra rods in here that don't belong. So if I if I open this up, yeah, I wasn't able to open it and check which rods go in here because it was so tight. I didn't want to force it there, so ratchet works. So I'm going to very gently, I'm going to wrap this in a rag and gently apply pressure to get this cap off so we can see what style heads are supposed to be on the rods. But I'm pretty sure these are the correct ones for this, which means that these belong to something else. Eh, happy to report that this unscrewed without too much fuss. You know, the key is wrapping a rag around these knurled areas because if the wrench slips the slightest bit and you've got the hard jaws in contact with this, it'll really mess up the knurling. You also don't want to clamp down too hard on this and make this out around. Yep, there we go. So, there we go. All right. So, so that's the zero to one. Well, turns out we've got uh, the zero to four inch rods over here, and then we've got the the one to four inch rods over here. So we're missing a rod to make another full set of uh, zero to four inch rods. So, and then we've got these uh, miscellaneous unknown rods. And look, these are matches too, two and two. I like that. All right, that's quite a mess of rods here. Well, I'm looking at my spare rods. I don't have any extra meditorial rods, but I do have what appears to be more of these rods. So I might, these look like they might be sterret. So I might be able to make a set of sterret rods out of what I've got here in, in these. All right, next up, we've got uh, an earlier sterret clamshell style case with the uh, with the Sterrett 210A point micrometer in it. Looks like it's in good shape. Foam's starting to get a little bit funky, but still okay. And another clamshell case. This one has a Sterrett, uh, oh okay, so this one has a Sterrett thread mic. This is a 575 in satin finish. It also looks like it's in great shape. And this particular one is for unified 20 to 24 pitch. This is a Sterrett disc micrometer or flange micrometer. This is a Sterrett 256. Ratchet's a little sticky, but it does work. That actually looks like it's in pretty good shape. Get the, oh, that's interesting. Is this a Metatoyo? Yeah, this is, I just realized this is a Metatoyo case. So that's going to come out of there. 115-253. I wonder what that is. Oh, that's the uh, tube micrometer, which I have right coming up. It's right here. Let's get it up now. <laughs> so, so this, I thought at first glance, I thought this was a regular uh, zero to one inch, but uh, yeah, 115-253. So this is a tubular micrometer. It's got uh, spherical ends. So this is good for wall thickness uh, on tubing. And then this is a uh, Sterrett uh, you know, universal anvil micrometer, or uh, I forgot what the other term is for this type of micrometer, but this is a, a number 220. It's nice, it has the correct stepped anvil in there right now. 
and then there's also a dowel style anvil, a pin type anvil that you could put in there. Lots of times if these go missing, guys will just use the hardened pin. Um, but this, if this anvil goes missing, it's a little harder to recreate. So that's nice that that's all there. This one actually says USGS. So it's that US government service or something like that, I don't know. Um, this is one of the items that I didn't even see in the photo, so it was just a little bit of a bonus. It doesn't really have a huge amount of value. It's a, it's a thickness gauge, so you put your sheet metal or whatever in here, and you can check the thickness in thousands. This one is made by the Ashcroft Manufacturing Company of New York. I've actually never seen one of these. Uh, this one is patented May 20 something, 1912. So that's uh, interesting. It's kind of a cheaper design. It's a lighter weight sheet metal tin. Actually, that, oh, okay, I see this is brass from where it's worn off here. This is probably nickel plated brass or something like that. Or chrome plated but anyways that's been around a long long time and then this was the other item that I didn't realize was was there uh, and then uh, when I saw it I was intrigued uh, case says it's for a 145 193 IMP 1 to 2 inch was it 1.2 inch so notice that there's a cutout on the box to allow the anvil to stick out. Uh, I mean the frames to stick out and that's because it is this kind of a funky deal. So it's like a caliper micrometer that I've had several of uh, but what's unusual about it is instead of having the traditional little jaws that have rounded its sides this actually has pins in it they might even be carbide and then uh you know sure enough it says 0.2 to 1.2 inch right there and then it's got this unusual frame added on it to allow you to hold it easier i guess so that's kind of neat um i might have to keep that one i don't know we'll see well, mystery solved. Uh, the reason why it looks very similar is because I have had these before. It turns out that uh, this is just a uh, inside caliper micrometer. Um, but what's unusual is I didn't realize that this is an accessory that was available you could purchase for this. This is a, a I think it's called a 300-400 accessory. And then, believe it or not, there's even a part number for this cap so we could I can actually put this cap back on and that explains why somebody modified this case you can see they that was just cut out by somebody I bet you this silly little accessory is hard to come by oh actually it's still right there on the uh, MSC website uh, the web price is twenty dollars and ninety three cents so you can buy one of those for your own if you want uh, then there was this micrometer just sitting there, uh, old as dirt. The JT Slocum zero to one inch from Providence, Rhode Island, and this is a NSK tenths micrometer, four to five inch Japanese. It's an early NSK. This actually is uh, not a horrible micrometer, really. I mean, it's got carbide faces. It's a tenth micrometer the lock still works the well the friction thimble doesn't work anymore but and it's got the you know the tense vernier on it so but paint's actually worn off the frame eh, make a cheap four to five for somebody and then we've got two Mitotoyo multi-anvil micrometers without cases just in these bags See, this one's missing the uh, flat anvil. It's just got the pin in there. This is the zero to one inch. And then this is the zero to two inch version. And this one 
I'm sorry, the, the one to two inch version. And again, this one has a pin uh, in it currently, but the, oh, there's two of them in there. Okay, good. So there's two of the same anvil in this bag. There's a brand new one unused right there. And then there's this one. So this one can go in here. All right. So uh, next up, we're going to look at the final item that was included in this $150 lot that was firm. And then I'm going to show you a couple more items in this episode that I picked at this estate. And uh, then the rest of it will probably save for a part two because I've got some unusual, unusual items coming up that you might find interesting. But talk about interesting. This was included in this lot. And she considered this to be a machinist tool. And it is a caliper, an unusual caliper. But let's start on the outside here. Uh, Scheibleher uh, für, für, für Klauenfutter. 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 Something like that. I don't know. I don't speak German. I can tell you the translation though from what I could figure out. This means caliper. So this is caliper for this clown fodder. Clown fodder. Clown fodder appears to translate to prong chuck. So it seems like this is a caliper for a prong chuck whatever a prong chuck is. Very strange. Notice the greenish military looking paint scheme. So there's a guy selling one of these on eBay right now. He is located in the Czech Republic. He is selling this box empty with nothing in it. And he's asking for 88 US dollars for it. Uh, I did find one other instance of someone who apparently did sell one of these in the box on eBay and it looked like they were asking for 220 US dollars. I don't know whether or not they actually got that because it was a really old eBay listing. I couldn't find it on eBay. I had, had to do a search through Google to find it. There was also a military auction um, a while back where they had this as one of the items and I wasn't able to find out how much that sold for. Um, so not a lot of information there. What I did find out though, um, because that guy in the Czech Republic, his description mentioned that there was a, something on his box right here stamped that indicated that this had a, a special ID number on it. And that number or that type of marking and number is something that was used by the German government. So uh, what I'm referring to is something called Waffenamt marks. W-A-F-F-E-N-A-M-T markings. Waffenamt. And this is something that I guess the government or the Wehrmacht, which I think was the German army, used as part of their as part of their inspection of various weapons and equipment so it appears this had something to do with the manufacture of weapons so if we look at this a little more closely uh it looks like a regular caliper at first glance but it has an unusual feature well first unusual feature of these feet sticking out like this right so this is kind of funky but if you close this all the way up you see there's a gap no gap here and it opens up to a gap here right so zoom on zoom in on this so you guys can get a look at that no markings on the back of any kind that I can see and then down here at the end, we got a whole lot going on. 
And one of the things that I can clearly see is it says 20 degrees. So my theory is, is that this is a 20 degree um, angle right here formed by these two jaws. Oh, so down here at the end are some of these markings that some of which may be these ver amped marks that I was talking about and might denote uh, information like the manufacturer and the year. Now it does say 43 there. That could be 1943. I forgot what ye up to what year these ver amped marks were used. Um, I think they started around 1938. I might be wrong. I'm not a uh, not a military collector of any type, or you know. So, so I don't know if you guys know anything about this. Hopefully, that's a better look for you guys. Um, so I have no idea what to value this at. Yeah, you know, I mean, I could just throw it up on eBay and see what it brings. But the problem with that is not knowing exactly how to describe it or list it might end up uh, not getting the right people looking at it. So right below the WH there, there's a stamp that it almost looks like it didn't form really well when it was stamped. When I look at that under magnification, it, to me, it appears to be a little um, uh, like an eagle, like a German eagle or something like that. All right, so I was able to make out that under that eagle, there is a Waffen, Waffen Amped number, um, and it is WAA42. Looking that up on a chart that's online, uh, that would indicate that this was made, or I should say this was inspected at least, so probably made in 1937, and that it was made in Dresden, Germany. Now, Dresden is a famous city in Germany because of what happened there uh, during the, uh, it was a manufacturing uh, area and it was basically firebombed out of existence by the Allied forces. So, um, in fact, uh, Kurt Vonnegut Jr. wrote a famous book called Fahrenheit 451. Uh, and the bombing of Dresden is talked about in that book. But anyways, uh, yeah, really horrible way to go, I'm sure. And that was, again, you know, there's, to this day there's controversy over was that necessary, uh, not unlike uh, the bombings of Japan, was it necessary to completely wipe out the entire city if you were only attacking the military targets? But I'm not going to get into a philosophical discussion about war. So I uh, found a website, germandaggers.com, and they give a nice little explanation, condensed explanation of the Waffenamt codes. Waffenamt, W-A-A, was the German Army Weapons Agency. It was founded on the 8th of November, 1919 as Reich Waffenamt and on the 5th of May, 1922, the name was changed to Heerwaffenamt. Heer the Heer Sub... Oh boy, I can't say that one at all. Uh, really long name. Was part of this organization and was responsible for the testing and acceptance of all weapons, equipment, and ammunition before delivery to the Wehrmacht. Waffenamt inspection departments were established in each factory and Waffenamt codes were the German inspection proof mark. When an officer was commissioned, he received a set of stamps with his assigned number and was posted to an inspection team. All team members used his stamps. The stamps moved with him if he was posted to a different team. Not all Waffenamt numbers have information available. This table includes information compiled for each identified Waffenamt number. Included are any company codes, company names, and year dates found stamped or printed on items with that number. Different Waffenamt numbers can be seen together, usually when a part was inspected, then inspected again after the item was assembled. 
the schwa sticker was added to the Waffen Amt Eagle in 1933. And then it shows some examples. So it looks like if my eagle was more pronounced, um, it would have that little schwa sticker below it. My eagle definitely looks like this guy with only the two, the, the, the three lines forming the wing. It's right above the number. So that suggests pre-1933. You see the later one has four lines. Then I found this site, uh, Eagle Relics, and they actually have a chart that shows the WAA A42 number listed twice. Once for this uh, C. Heineschen, Dresden 1937, but then also for a GEBR period Klinge, K-L-I-N-G-E, Dresden 1936. So if I understand the, the description of the Waffenamt marks from the German Dagger site correctly, these names right here are the names of the actual inspector whose stamp was used by his team to stamp these things. So that's why you have 1936, 1937, two different names. Uh, something happened and the guy who was doing it in 1936 was changed at this factory to the different guy. Here's one up here. So now I searched that guy. And again, it's all about, it's all about leather. Uh, it's all about Luger holsters. So I don't know what I'm gonna do about this yet, but anyways, I thought it was very interesting. Hope you guys found that interesting. Um, let me show you just a couple other things I grabbed at this estate, and then we'll, uh, we'll save the rest of the more odd things that I picked up for the next episode. So when I first got there, uh, she mentioned she did have this one other machinist item that uh, she had for sale but that uh, she wanted $50 for this. So this is a, a nice, uh, you know, nice joinery on this box here. It's an original brown and sharp box. It's big, right? What could it be? It is a brown and sharp model 5851. Uh, is it a height check? What do they call this? Brown and Sharp's got a weird name for these. Oh, I forget what Brown and Sharp calls these things. Height check cater or something like that. Uh, this one's in really good shape. And what you have is you have all of these uh, precision lapped spaces here. Okay. They are all exactly one inch apart from each other. So you have almost like a course adjustment of one inch with every step that you take here but then you also have via this knob on the top here you have a fine adjustment in thousands and you also have a counting window here so you can get uh, you know like roughly close to how many thousands you want to dial up and then you can use the little uh, <clears throat> lines here and the little vernier lines to actually get really close to what you want to set. So this would obviously be used with a uh, rather large surface plate. They're not really in demand in most production shops anymore, I don't think. It's just a really nice piece of history. You know, they still occasionally come up on eBay, but they're very heavy and difficult to ship. So that makes it difficult to sell these online. So I don't know what I'm going to do with this one. But uh, I ended up getting this thing for, uh, she wanted 50 bucks. But then after I gave her her full asking price of the 150 on that other lot, uh, I was able to get her to take 180 for everything. So I, it's like I got this for 30 bucks. So pretty cool. I just recently saw one of these at the uh, Thompson Speedway International Swap Meet. It was a little bit shorter one. I think it was a, tw um, well, this is a this is a 12 inch, so I'm not sure what size that one was. But I'm pretty sure it was shorter than this. And it didn't have the case and it was in much rougher condition. And uh, I think that gentleman wanted uh, like uh, 45 or 50 for his. And it was, now that I think of it, it wasn't even a uh, Brown and Sharp, it was a Cadillac which I think I still have a Cadillac that I picked up a while back. It's sitting up there on my uh, 
my hall of shame, which is just basically a whole bunch of expensive, back in the day, very expensive height checks and uh, surface gauges and whatnot that now they just, uh, like I said, they're just expensive pieces of history.